In this module 7, we are going to be talking about some of the classical methods for data simulation. These techniques look at prediction as an initial value problem. So, I am going to provide some background to motivate the kind of algorithms that have been used in the early 50s when data simulation began to be used by uh, national centers for weather prediction. So, it was realized long back that prediction numerical weather prediction is an initial value problem. You may have we may have already alluded to this in, in module 1.2 when we talked about data mining, data simulation and prediction. We argued that data mining, data uh, simulation and prediction are three different components of the predictive science. So, the notion of prediction becomes important. If you are going to be using dynamic models to create prediction, it has been known for a long time at least since early 1900s uh, that prediction as a mathematical problem is an initial value problem. This acceptance of the fact that prediction is an initial value problem for a given class of dynamic models calls for knowing the values of the state variable on the computational grid of the initial time. For example, if I have a dynamical model, if the solutions of the dynamical model are predictions or you are going to generate forecast product as a functions of the solutions of mathematical model to be able to pull the model solution I need to be able to get it started at a given time. And so, if I assume t is equal to 0 is a given time I need to be I need to be uh, uh, have the I need to have the values of the state variable on the entire computational grid at initial time and that in mathematics we generally call initial condition. So, to get the initial value problem going I need an initial condition. In here I would like to bring a couple of other uh, uh, constraints. The size of the computational grid that is often used in prediction is often limited by computing power. The larger the uh, number of points in the computational grid larger is going to be the time required. So, in before you deciding on the size of the computational grid in trying to solve the prediction problem as an initial early problem you need to make sure what kind of computing power you have available for you to be able to create the prediction. So, we have so we will now assume some of the few things that are needed to get going. I know the computing power contingent on the computing power I have already decided on the size and the maximum size of the grid I could compute. I have the model dynamics I have the model dynamics discretized on the chosen computational grid which is consistent with the computing power. So, continuous time models have been discretized I have been reduced to discrete time models whether it is a continuous time model discrete time model so long as a dynamic model I need initial conditions. So, I am now going to explore some of the classical methods for transferring data from the observation network to the computational grid so as to initialize the model. In the early days while the computing power was not very high. So, they were limited to regional models or very coarse global models. The standard models uh, uh, are given by partial differential equations. So, you discretize the given model on the grid to be able to initialize this model I want to have initial conditions. 
the initial condition is the unknown we have been talking about estimating various quantities here the thing that I have to estimate is the initial condition what is the input data from which I am going to have to estimate the initial condition that comes from the data observation. So, I am assuming we are given a set of observation stations in the early days in the pre satellite pre radar day uh, era they essentially had ground stations they essentially had balloons in different parts of the world. So, the sensor network was very sparse the amount of observation that were available for use in estimating the initial condition was much smaller. So, these are all some of the background information one need to keep in mind to understand how before powerful computers came to be before powerful methods of dynamic data simulations were used to be able to generate prediction uh, how they managed to create reasonably good prediction how they estimated the initial condition from the data this is the class of problem that we are going to be dealing with and um, 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 in the next in this and the next couple of uh, uh, modules. In the early days observation network were very sparse they are essentially land based observations available at fixed sites around the globe. Modern days remotely sensed data are available along specific tracks using satellites or radars. This calls for lifting or interpolating the data from the observation network to the computational grid. In the early days this aspect of transferring the information from the observation from the sparse observation network to a denser computational grid was called objective analysis. So, you can in some sense say objective analysis where the forerunners of the modern day data simulation systems that are used by meteorological centers around the world. This lifted data will constitute the initial conditions for the model. So, once the initial condition was fixed the model ran forward we made prediction. At this time I would like to be able to recall the relation between this and what we did in 4D war. In 4D war what is that we assumed same same kind of thing I have a model I have observations at different times may perhaps in different locations. I would like to be able to fit the model solution to the observation in the least square sense we used an objective function to be able to determine the initial condition once I have determined the optimal initial condition using 4D war forward sensitivity method we then ran the model forward in time this run of the uh, this forward run of the model starting from the optimal initial condition provided a reasonably good forecast. So, you can see the 4D war is a method that came to be used around 1980s the classical methods began in 1950s. So, you can see the similarity in the way in which they tackle the problem of trying to find the optimal initial condition those days in the pre 4D war era in the pre formal data simulation era. So, that is what I am trying to provide a background on. So, until the late 1940s atmospheric forecast was generated from essentially subjective analysis which are based on analysis of weather maps. So, that is what is called subjective analysis yes, the only tool they had is uh, 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 was available uh, to them was uh, the, the, the isobaric surfaces depicted as weather maps. The new era of objective analysis began in 1949 with Hans Panofsky. He for the first time began this formal method of being able to transfer the information from a sparse observation network to a denser computational network to be able to lift or spread the information from observation network to the computational network. To that end he fitted 
a third degree polynomial with 10 coefficients to the observations of wind and geopotential wind and geopotential. So, one could say within the parlance of atmospheric sciences 1949 the work of Panofsky may have been one of the early work which he called objective analysis which resembles the modern day data simulation uh, 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 framework. But this approach in 1949 please remember that the stored program digital computers came into existence only in 1951-52. Von Neumann and his group used the first available stored program digital machine in 1951-52 to solve the geostrophic vorticity equation and they made a first 20 hour forecast. This was pre computer era the computer era was just about to break loose in 1949. So, he faced lots of computational challenges and unfortunately while the idea is, is decent and workable it, it met with several operational difficulties mathematical computational difficulties. Nevertheless, it is it is not out of out of uh, 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 consideration to, cons uh, to 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 think of Panofsky as one who sowed the seed for an objective analysis of transferring information from observation to some un to estimating unknown 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 state. So you can see the semblance of the ideas of estimation coming from the world of atmospheric sciences. Shortly after that in the mid 50s Brecht Thorsen and Deuce used 300 kilometer computational grid covering the North Atlantic region. So, they because the computers were, were limited 1955 stored program digital computers have come into existence. I want to give you an idea of how sophisticated the computer technology at that time was. They only had a computer they did not have any programming language they did not have any compiler. So, when von Neumann and his group used the computers to make the 24 hour prediction they essentially programmed everything in machine language. Anybody who has done programming in assembly level language you would know how involved it could be to be able to code all the programs in the machine level language using simply codes uh, using strings of zeros and ones. The Fortran was invented only around that time the Fortran compiler came to be by mid 1950s. So, this notion of being able to write programs in a general purpose language such as Fortran became a commonplace around the mid 1950s. So, it is everything was very raw people did not quite understand how to utilize this monster called computers. So, uh, along uh, so, so much have to be developed in terms of system software programming languages compilers operating systems all these things were, were trying to bubble up. It is at that time Beck Thorson and Deuce used a computational grid with 300 kilometers to do a regional analysis covering North Atlantic region parts of North America as well as Europe. They created so they wanted to be able to um, uh, bring in the observation onto a grid to be able to have a very nice initial condition from which to run the model forward the model solution will become a forecast. But they had a very good idea. So, what did they do? They thought of two pieces of information one they thought that I already have climatology based information on the grid which is called the background state. So, they, they, they introduced the notion of what is called the background state background state sorry they introduced the notion of what is called a background state. In modern language what is background state background state is, is a prior is the belief that you have about the state of the system before you took the very first observation. How did they create the first background? they create it as a linear combination of climatology and the procedure that they used using which they had made a forecast the 12 hour forecast. So, 
this is the present time this is minus t they ran their method from minus t to 0 forward that is a 12 t is equal to 12 hours. So, minus 12 hours to 0 they made a forecast. So, that forecast had information on the grid about the state of the system they are looking at. Of course, they also have the information from climatology they simply took some arbitrary linear combination of the climatology and the forecast from 12 hours. To start with you may ask where do they get the forecast from. So, to start with they did not have any forecast. So, they essentially used climatology to, 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 to do the things. So, this is one way of trying to initialize the, 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 the model in this particular case no observation can be is, is used. But then nevertheless having a background information on the grid is one piece of information. You can see the beginnings of Bayesian philosophy right there. What is the element of the Bayesian philosophy that is a prior is the belief I had before I started doing anything. Then I started making observations observations give me some new information Bayesian philosophy always looks at combining the prior belief with the new information to get the posterior. You can see the elements of that Bayesian philosophy inherent in 1955 within the context of atmospheric science prediction in the work in the work of Beck, Thorson and Deuce. So, they, in other words they created a state from all the using all the available information at that time you can think of it like that. Then they had access to observations observations of 500 millibar height. What did they then do? So, you can think of it like this now this is the computational grid So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4. So, n is equal to 5 times 4 is equal to 20 computational grid. Let us pretend the observation locations are in those points. So, given this grid and the location for the observation, so you can think of the dots of the observation network. Mathematically one can think of interpolating data from the observation network to the grid or from grid to the observation network that is a simple mathematical interpolation scheme. I can do what is called bilinear interpolation scheme which are very, very simple. So, what did they do? They first built the background information on the grid then they interpolated this background information on the grid to the observation location. So, at the observation location they have the background information which is obtained by interpolating the background information on the grid to the observation network. Then at the observation network you conduct observation observations are available made available. So, that is the second piece of information that you have at the observation of the observation locations. So, what are the observations here? The observations are essentially 500 millibar height. So, they had an, an estimate of the 500 millibar height from the background information they have the observation of the 500 millibar height from reality. They have already interpolated the background uh, 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 to the observation site. So, at each observation site they have two pieces of information then what did they do? they used a distance dependent weight function to iteratively blend the increment the, the, uh, uh, the background and the observations. That is the very beautiful heuristic scheme it worked it became to be used in operational centers. You can see the fundamental philosophy of Bayesian inherent in here. So, instead of working in the computational grid they worked in the observation space. So, in modern language you can say you can do assimilation in the observation space or in the model space. They had a two way communication between the observation network and the computational network which is the grid. 
by developing this two dimensional bridge between these two worlds of observation the world of observation network and to the world of computational network they were able to go in between. So, they converted everything on the computational grid to the observation network. So, at the observation network they have the representative background information they have the representative observation increment um, observation um, um, information they simply blended them in a heuristic way. How did they blend it? They essentially blended heuristically using a yeah, weighting scheme that depend on distance that depend on distance. So, that is the fundamental idea of some of the earliest work that happened I am sorry. Now, we are going to mathematically describe a general iterative scheme that embodies the vectors and those ideas that is that is what I am going to be talking about in a mathematical form. So, let us pretend Okay, so you, you can do this iteration. Sorry, you can do this iterative process as I mentioned in the previous slide, either on the computational network, which is the computational grid, or the observation network. Now I'm going to reformulate that problem as one of doing on the computational grid itself. Computational grid itself. So let's start the process. So let us assume I have a computational grid the computational grid such as the one that I had given in the previous one. So, let us assume I have a, a 20 point computational grid. So, in this case x is a 20 dimensional vector x 1 to x. So, I can number them as 3, 4, 5 all the way up to 20 all the way up to 20 it could be. So, in this particular case it is the 500 millibar height that is the state of the system that is being operated on. So, let x naught be a vector on this grid of size 20 that provides that gives that that represents the background information. What is this background information? This background information x naught belonging to R n. So, n in this example is, tw is 20 the background information is obtained as a linear combination of everything I know from previous forecasts if there are available climatology information so on and so forth. So, I develop a mosaic on my grid. So, x naught background information is simply a mosaic uh, a smooth mosaic of, of, of the state um, obtained from anything I can put my fingers on. Then z is the observation that comes to us z is r m please understand r n and r m m and n are different in general m is less than n. I had more number of grid points less number of observation that is how they started in 1950s until recently until remote sensing became possible such as radar such as uh, satellite the amount of observation is always smaller than the size of the grid. With satellites and radar the amount of observation has become more and more computing power has become better and better our desire to increase the number of computational uh, 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 size of the computational grid namely to reduce the grid spacing becomes uh, uh, more and more possible. So, there is a race between how finer I can make the computational grid making n larger. I can also there is also a race but um, how much more observations I can have from satellite radar and everything else put together. So, m is keeps increasing n keeps increasing as our ability to observe nature becomes better and better as our ability to create computers becomes better and better. So, m and n are, are, are not fixed they are changing in time from era to era to era to era. So, h is the interpolation matrix we have already talked about how to design h in our module uh, uh, 3.6 just to refresh your memory h is a matrix. So, this is the model space this is the observation space this is x this is z this is h. So, h is a mapping from 
ob, ob, from model space the observation space is called the forward operator. Sometimes h comes out of the physics, sometimes h comes out of empirical rules, sometimes h comes out of interpolation formulas. So, if I have a if I have a grid as in the previous case if I have a grid if, if so in this in, in this particular example n is 20 in this case m is essentially phi. I have 5 observation locations and 20 computational grid m is less than n. So, this is one of the situation that they were facing in the in those days. The idea of this presentation is to make clear how clever they were in the pre formal data simulation era how they mimic some of the ideas and how they developed some of the ideas which we know much more formally uh, and they had lot of intuition to be able to uh, uh, come up with these ideas. So, H is the interpolation matrix. So, I can go between the computational grid and the observational network. So, I have now everything I have a prior information I am sorry I have a prior information given by given by x naught. I have observation I have h. If I were to have done Bayesian I would simply combine x naught with z either in a uh, 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 well either, either using uh, uh, not either using it using Bayesian framework and would have created a posterior and use the posterior as my new initial condition to run the model forward in time. But in those days what did they do? They picked a weighted a, a weighting matrix. This weight matrix is the one that has a distant dependent weighting scheme. So, almost all the methods that were used in the 1950s and 60s in different parts of the world, essentially USA and Sweden is in, is spearheaded the, the development of these schemes, but Thorsen and Dues were doing in Sweden. Uh, uh, in USA, the 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 national uh, uh, weather center uh, uh, also developed similar iterative schemes. Both the schemes have similar mathematical structure they differed in the way in which the matrix W the weight matrix W was defined and used. This type of scheme became operational in the early in, in the early mid 50s. So, what is the basic idea? So, now let us go to equation 1 x naught is the background z is the information h of x naught you can think of it as a model predicted observation z minus h of x naught is the new information that the observation has that the background did not. So, you can think of z minus h x naught uh, 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 h of x naught as the innovation you multiply by a weight you add to x naught. So, what is that you get you get x 1 is equal to x naught plus w times z minus h of x naught. So, x naught did not have any information about about, about z, z did not have any information about x naught, but x 1 is a linear combination of x naught and z. You could have also rewritten this to be i minus i i minus w h x naught plus w z. So, this is the weight matrix that is used for initial condition this is the weight matrix that is used for observation you can think of x 1 to be the linear combination of the background information and the observation. This is what I want you to I, I want to see the emphasis here is that you can see the Bayesian philosophy. So, they are trying to use the Bayesian philosophy without explicitly formalizing it in the Bayesian framework. So, they were very clever to anticipate some of the things to come then what did they what did they do? They then did x 2 is equal to x 1 plus w z minus h of x 1. So, what is the basic idea here? They were z minus h of x 1 is the residual from x from using x 1 z minus h of x naught is the residual from using x naught, but this second residual should be in principle better than the first residual because the first residual did not uh, has has uh, x naught did not depend on z z did not depend on x naught, but in this case x 1 depends on z and x naught. 
So, you can readily see this iterative scheme x k plus 1 is equal to x k plus w times z minus h of x k became a very simple minded scheme. You can see the beginnings of Kalman filter right here. We have already seen in the last lecture on Kalman filters. In Kalman filter what is the form? The posterior which we call analysis is equal to x prior plus Kalman gain times z minus h of x prior. Hey, this is the form of Kalman filter. We, 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 we have alluded to in the in, in, in the morning and we derived the basic equations. So, I have prior information z minus h x p gives you the new information that the prior uh, did not have that comes from the new observation. I multiply the new information by k, k is called the Kalman gain prior is also called background. So, you can see previous information and the new information together makes x a which is called analysis. So, posterior prior observation innovation that we talk about in this language even though they did not talk in this kind of a language the equation 1 had all the underpinnings of the modern methodology except for all the mathematical artifice that goes with it. To me that is that is that is very interesting because without knowing many things they had good intuition. I also want to tell you one more Kalman filter was not invented until 1960-61. So, in 50s when these folks were wo working in operational centers interested with the job of producing forecasts, they did not there was no Kalman filter to speak of. But they are all clever people they know dynamics very well they also knew, knew reasonably good statistics they were aware of good statistical principles for estimation. And on the top of it they are very clever people they knew how if you have two pieces of information you need to be able to mix it that is a fundamental idea. That fundamental idea carries even today and is the centerpiece of any and every data simulation scheme of all types. So, this became the, the equation 1 became the, the, the workhorse of the data simulation industry and was used both in USA and Sweden to be able to generate appropriate initial conditions. So, let us talk about that part now. So, if you run this iteration you need to truncate this iteration you cannot continue forever. When did you truncate? You truncated the iteration when z minus h of x k the norm of that vector became very small. That means, there is no more juice left in z that has not been transferred to x k. If all the juice left in z has been referred has been transferred to x k z might get closer to h of x k. If z uh, h of x k is closer to z if h of x k is closer to z the innovation becomes smaller and smaller. If the innovation becomes smaller and smaller there is not much juice left I can I can I can truncate. So, at the time when they truncated I am going to get a state. So, let, let, let us assume they truncated and at the result the state that results out of the truncation is called x star. What is this x star? This x star would now be used as an initial condition in the model from which they generate the forecast. So, the x star is the initial condition that comes as an estimate by running one iteratively until convergence. The reason I wanted to bring this because even though this does not embody any of the mathematics that we have seen you can see the underpinnings of latter date uh, 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 data simulation methodology already inherent in these ideas uh, uh, that was proposed in the in the early and mid 1950s. In the United States the person who was spearheading the scheme is Kressman. In Sweden it was Brechtosen and two, uh, Dues. The paper by Kressman, the paper by Brechtosen and Dues even today if you start reading them it is very inspirational. How they thought of incorporating data with prior information 
to be able to have the good facility to be able to transfer data between observation network and the computational network. Now, I am going to talk about the weighting scheme. So, what is the only thing that we have not specified? How did they pick the weight matrix? How did the Kressman scheme and the Bertholson scheme differ? They differed in the way in which they described or they picked the weight matrix. So, essentially both were running along similar tracks, but used different weights because of their belief in different philosophy of the influence of observation on the grid. Sorry, yeah. So, now I am going to talk about uh, the basic idea of the weighting scheme that is uh, that was used by 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 Kressman. So, weighting scheme. So, consider the ith grid point. The grid grids are numbered. So, let us go back to the little diagram again. This let this be the computational grid. In this case 1 2 3 4 5 1 2 3 4 5 I have 5 times 5 I have a set of 25 points. So, n is equal to 25 let me assume the observations are sparsely distributed like this maybe like that. The grids are numbered this is 1 2 3 4 5 and so on. So, let this be the i at the grid point you pick a d greater than 0 and consider it to be the radius of influence. The radius of influence is, was, 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 was very was a very good idea. So, let us talk about this now. Does the temperature in Bangalore India does it depend on the temperature in Delhi India? The distance between Delhi and India is way too much therefore, you would expect the temperature between Bangalore and Delhi to be less correlated. However, if you consider a town which is only 10 miles away from Bangalore downtown there will be better correlation between that small town which is only 10 kilometers as opposed to over 2000 kilometers. So, what does what does that mean? If I consider a grid point I if there are observations around the grid point which observation location will be affecting the quantity of state at the location i. So, they said well like everything else in life uh, um, I have to consider what is called a circle of influence or a, a radius of influence this radius is called d. So, what does it mean? You take a circle with i as a center d as a radius I am considering a two dimensional problem now you can imagine the three dimensional version of this problem later. So, if I consider i as a center at d as the radius look at all the observation location that are in within that circle we are going to postulate only those observations that are within a distance d from the point i are going to be influential in affecting the state at the point i. So, that is the very beautiful concept that arises out of the notion of influence of one grid point on the other grid point or one observation stations on the grid point. So, let n i d be a sphere or, or a circle of radius d centered at i let m i be the number of observations that are inside the sphere centered at i. Let r i j be the distance between the chosen grid point i and the location of the jth observation inside the circle of radius d center at i. So, what does it mean? In this case this is an observation inside this is an observation inside this is an observation inside. So, in this case for this m i is 3 in this particular example and then I can also compute the distance. So, let us assume this is the first observation this is the second observation this is the third observation. So, this is r i 1 
this is R i 2, this is R i 3. So, R i j is the distance from the ith grid point to the jth observation j running from 1 to m i, m i is the total number of observation that are bounded uh, that, that are contained within the bound defined by a sphere or, or, or a circle of radius d. I hope that is clear now. So, I am trying to divide the observation into two groups one that influences i the other that does not influence i. If I pick d to be very large every observation would affect i. If I pick d to be very small only a smaller number of operations of, of observations will affect i. There is no formula for the choice of i, but it, it makes sense to think about the notion of observation influence in grid and the influence dependent on the distance. So, that is a very beautiful and a fundamental idea. So, what did Kussman and his group do? They, devi uh, they, they, they devised a weighting scheme W i j. Please remember that W is a matrix. W i j are the elements of, of, of W i uh, are the elements of the matrix. So, W i j bar is the element i j the element of the matrix that affects sorry that affects the ith grid that affects the ith grid and um, so W bar i j is equal to d square minus r square i j divided by d square plus r square i j. So, this weight is less than 1 for all r i j less than d that was the non zero weight for otherwise it is 0. So, the equation 2 essentially provided you a, a method by which they chose the weight. Once you choose the weight like this let me go back to my iterative scheme in equation 1. So, I have a means I have a means of choosing w once I have a means of choosing w everything else is given in here. I can run this iteration, I can truncate it at an appropriate condition, I can get x star. Once I get x star, I have initial condition, use, use that as an initial state to solve my initial value problem. So, that is how operational resource centers operated in those days. Now, you may you may want to discuss why this scheme, why not any other scheme. Again, I want you to understand this is simply a heuristic this is simply a heuristic. So, you 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 probably cannot quibble with it too long or too much because it makes sense it makes sense and in, in what way it makes sense when r i j becomes d the weight becomes 0. That means, for for points on the circle the weight is 0 for points inside the circle the weight is larger for points outside the circle the weight is undefined. So, it is this ability to give that cutoff they probably decided the, the, the formula to be like this. There are very many differing methods for computing this weight. Brick Thorson and Dews picked weight according to one formula, Crossman did another by another formula. Um, in those days you in the, if you lo look into the literature there are at least half a dozen different ways of picking w. Mathematically speaking all are equivalent that w essentially uh, let us go back w essentially uh, decide the strength by which I am going to update x k to become x k plus 1. In other words how much weight it gives to the 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 the, the, the innovation. So, uh, uh, the Grassmann algorithm continued. S so, I have x k plus 1 is equal to x k plus w z minus h of x k again x, x naught is the background state this is called the innovation. I would like to be able to create my w we gave w bar in the previous equation 2 I am now going to normalize my 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 weights. So, I am going to define w i j to be equal to w bar i j divided by s i s i is simply the sum of all the numerator. So, this way I am going to make sure that the weights are normalized and, 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 and the individual values are going to be between 0 and 1. So, this is a very nice scheme 4. So, if I use the scheme 4 I am sorry if I use the scheme 
2 to define W bar if I use the scheme 4 to normalize it and if I use this normalized weight in 3 you get the you get you get the Cressman scheme. I want to re-emphasize Cressman in the mid 1950s had anticipated Kalman filter even before Kalman filter was invented. To me that is the novel aspect of it this is Kalman N A N sorry. Uh, a Kalman filter was invented and 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 that is a that is a very important uh, uh, information that one need to keep in mind. Oh I am sorry we have, we have we have done this sorry good. Now I am going to tell you for the sake of completeness one more weighting scheme that came in 1964 that is called Barnes scheme. Um, that is a little story I would like to tell. Barnes was working at the University of Oklahoma where I am currently working. University of uh, Oklahoma and National Severe Storms Lab they essentially pioneered the use of radar meteor ra uh, use of Doppler radar in meteorology. So, they would like to be able to develop schemes by which they can utilize the radar information and transfer the radar information onto the grid. So, they did something in the mid 60s similar to what Cressman and Bechthorsen has done in the mid 50s, uh, but instead of instead of 500 millibar height the, the, the emphasis by Barnes was essentially using radar related data. So, he, uh, Barnes essentially developed a weighting scheme that still rests on the notion of a radius of influence all points at a distance r a j from i that means, if this is the point i, if this is the region of influence, if this is 1, 2, 3 uh, m i, this is j, the distance from here is r i j. So, if r i j is less than d, d is the radius of this uh, circle, the weight w i j bar is equal to is a Gaussian structure. You can really see exponential minus of r i j square by d square. So, it is it's, it's a Gaussian shaped function it was 0 otherwise. So, it is a kind of a truncated Gaussian sitting over a sphere of radius d you can readily imagine that that weight function. So, this Gaussian weighting function was used and he was also a little bit more sophisticated what did he do he did not keep the radius fixed he first started with a larger radius what does it mean he wanted to bring in as much of influence from as many observations as possible. So, if, 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 if I pick d to be large larger number of observations are going to affect the grid point. So, and then he continuously started shrinking the sphere of influence and what is the scheme he used to reduce the, um, uh, uh, the radius of the sphere of influence he decided r k plus 1 is r times r k where r is less than 1. That means, he started from a larger radius and kept on shrinking it because he would like to get the benefit of as many as possible, but he wanted to make sure those who are closer had more influence than those who are far away. So, he essentially shrunk, he had an adaptive scheme by which he adapted the value of the radius in some fashion by which he shrunk. Did he shrink it to 0? No. When it became a particular value at that point he kept it because he wanted to make sure that 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 he did not shrink the region of influence to 0. Why am I mentioning this I just want you to think about there are all kinds of interesting heuristic ideas fixed d variable d Gaussian based weight function other heuristic based weight function. These are all the variations in the theme, but the ultimate aim is to be able to consider a background consider the observation try to transfer information from observation to the grid. The grid is the one that I would like to be able to update. So, you do this iterative process this iterative process in some sense is the data simulation scheme that were used in the 50s and 60s. It is here they they they, they combined the background information with the observation to be able to create the new mosaic which comes out of the iterative scheme the mosaic being a good initial condition from which they can run the model forward. So, all these schemes were offline experiments they did 
to be able to create the initial condition x star. What is x star? x star is the value of x k at the time when you cut off the iteration and from x star then they generated the forecast. I think from a historical perspective and also to be able to appreciate how people did in the early days of computer era. I want to emphasize that the data the subjective analysis was the order of the day until 19 mid 40s. It is it is there was already an anticipation that computers are just around the corner. Hans Panofsky described an interpolation scheme, but it was riddled with problems. Computers came, Van Neumann proved the use of computers in making 24 hour forecast. If you have the ability to make a 24 hour forecast, the interest in getting good initial condition to run the model forward became center stage. So, Van Neumann's work provided the motivation to be able to create a very good initial condition. And with that as a motivation, research in Sweden and the United States uh, uh, sprung up. Bathos and Tools, Grassmann, Barnes, these are various kinds of early examples of data assimilation schemes where they very cleverly combine background information and the, 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 the data to be able to create this mosaic. And what is this mosaic in, in modern language? In some sense we can think of that as an analysis because it is a combination of prior with observation. Now, if you think back what does data simulation do in general? I have prior, I have observation you get posterior. In statistics they call posterior, posterior is called analysis in geosciences. So, analysis and posterior are exactly one and the same. So, I wanted to again re-emphasize the, the, the cleverness of the idea, the cleverness of the formula the anticipation of Kalman like scheme even before Kalman filter came to be. I, to me to me these are very 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 important observation historically as well as these ideas are very inspiring should be inspiring to anybody. So, again if you have w bar i j given by phi I can normalize it as in 7 I can normalize it as in 7. So, the initial so the initial field please understand what is the idea here I am interested in creating the initial field. Initial field is obtained by iterating this starting from x naught the background and the observation. So, that is 8. Now, I would like to indulge um, 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 your interest in a theoretical question. Suppose you can you, you, you iterate it like this will it ever converge under what condition this iterative scheme will converge. That means, am I guaranteed to get an analysis if I ran the iterative scheme of Crossman as an example unto asymptotic time. I think the convergence result and the convergence question becomes very fundamental and important the, that has already been worked out. So, I am going to provide you a glimpse into the concept of convergence of iterative schemes used in the early days in data simulation. To do that you multiply the equation 1 you may remember the equation 1 x k plus 1 is equal to x k plus w times z minus h of x k. Now, multiply both sides of the equation by h. Now, I change the variable. So, I am now trying to bring in. So, until now everything was little heuristic. Now, I am going to talk about some mathematical structure relating to the convergence of the iterative scheme to understand will it ever converge. If I know if it is going to converge after a longer period of iteration I can truncate it. If I truncated it the truncated value should not be too far away from the convergence because I really prove convergence. So, to be able to understand the quality of the state that I will get when I truncate it before uh, uh, at, at some after some finite iterations uh, one need to be able to inquire about will it converge had I gone had I not stopped but continued. To, 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 to examine this I am now going to concoct a new variable eta k is equal to h of x k. I am going to uh, 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 change the name of the product matrix h and w to be t with this change of notation this equation becomes eta k plus 1 is equal to eta k plus, uh, uh, plus t times z minus uh, eta k here t is a m by m matrix 
and by a matrix. Look at this now. While the scheme originally the scheme 1 was originally defined on the computational grid, the equivalent scheme 10 is defined on the observation network. Why is that? How did I bring the iteration from the computational world to the observation network? By the magic of H. Please remember H is the bridge between observation world and the computational grid world or the model space. So, you can think of convergence in, in, in both the domains because I can translate the results from one domain to another domain. So, I would like to understand the asymptotic properties of the iterative scheme on 10th given by 10. You can now rewrite 10 as you can subtract z from both sides. Let us go back. You can subtract z from both sides and after a little bit of an algebra you can re you can see you get the equation 11 eta k plus 1 minus z is i minus t times z minus eta k. So, iterating this iterating iterating this I think I, I yeah it I think it just might be eta did I did I did I did I screw it up I think it must be this must be I am sorry one second uh, let me check on that um, z uh, eta k minus t z no this must be minus this must be plus I am sorry this must be eta k minus z the same structure as this sorry for that for that for that error. So, you got you, you, you got 11. Now, I can iterate 11 if I iterate at 11 eta k minus z is equal to i minus t to the power k eta naught minus z. So, what is eta naught? Eta naught is equal to h times x naught. What is z? z is the observation. So, eta naught is my predicted observation x naught is my background. So, is a predicted observation from the background using h z naught z is the actual observation the difference between the two is the innovation. That innovation is going to be multiplied by i minus t to the power k to get eta k minus z. So, you can think of eta k minus z as an increment. So, this is an initial in, so this is an initial increment increment at k equal to 0 this is the increment at a general time k the increment at time k is the kth the power of the matrix times the increment at time 0. So, if I had an equation x k is equal to 8 to the power of k x naught if absolute value of a is less than 1 you readily know limit k tending to infinity of x k is 0. Therefore, by in analogy with this now you can see if the k to the power of i minus t goes to 0 as k, as, as, as k goes to infinity eta k minus z will go to 0. So, eta k will match the observation eta k will match the observation. So, what is eta k? Please remember eta k is equal to h of x k that means the state at the grid will match the observation if there is going to be convergence. So, the whole convergence now rests on the properties of the matrix i minus t to the power k or in principle it rests on the properties of the matrix i minus t. Please remember what is t? t is t. Please remember, remind. Uh, let us remind ourselves of this. Uh, uh, t is equal to is equal to h times w. What is h? H is the interpolation matrix. What is w? W is the is 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 the weight. Weight was created heuristically. W is again created heuristically by way of interpolation. There are infinitely many ways of choosing h. There are infinitely many ways of choosing w. Now, we are going to ask what particular choice of w and h will give you a t that will induce the property namely i minus t to the power k will go to 0 that is the mathematical question here. 
So, what does it depend on? It depends on the uh, that is correct. Now, I am since eta k is equal to h of x k now I am going to substitute 12 in 8. So, if you did this substitution now I have come back from the observation network to the computational network I have uh, I have transferred from the observation network to the computational network iterating 13 since x naught is equal to x b what is x b x b is the background x k minus x b what is x k minus x b that is what is called analysis increment x k is the current analysis at the result of um, k iteration x b is the background. So, that is the analysis increment you can think of x k minus x b as an analysis increment z my z naught is the initial increment in the in the in the prior information. So, you can see the analysis increment is expressed as this sum. So, for convergence as we have already pointed out i minus t to the power k must tend to infinity if this goes to infinity convergence will happen when convergence happens we are guaranteed we will get decent combination of the prior and the observation decent combination of the prior and the observation. So, under what condition the convergence will happen? So, consider the matrix I minus again we are now we are going back to the matrix theory to be able to formalize some of the convergence results. I under what condition I minus t to the power k is 0 it will happen only when the spectral radius of the matrix I minus t is less than 1. Please remember spectral radius is related to is related to maximum eigenvalue maximum singular values eigenvalue singular values they are they are related concepts eigenvalue becomes the spectral radius for symmetric matrices singular values becomes the spectral radius for non general non symmetric matrices. Uh, we already know rho a is called the spectral radius of a is equal to is equal to i minus t. So, if the spectral radius is less than 1 we it is it, it can be shown that the power of the matrix is going to be is going to be is going to be uh, uh, tending to 0. Now, I am going to provide a uh, uh, few other uh, steps in here. In general if a is the matrix i minus a inverse can be expressed in the power series and this series is the matrix analog of 1, mi one, 1 over 1 by x is equal to 1 plus x plus x square. So, that is an infinite series we all know. So, this is equal to 1 minus x to the power minus 1 this is a standard series you we all should know about it from basic calculus. So, if I put x is equal to a I get this series this series can be divided into two parts the first k terms the rest of the k terms and uh, the, the rest of all terms I can take a to the power of k as a common factor from the second again this sum is infinite therefore, this is equal to finite sum plus a to the power of k i minus i minus a minus uh, this this cannot be uh, uh, 1 this could be i I am sorry this would be i therefore, summation a to the power of j is given by this equation again little bit of algebra is given by this equation is given by this equation therefore, this sum is equal to this sum this sum is equal to this sum and uh, substituting 16 and 14 I get x k minus b is given by this therefore, if i minus t to the power k tends to 0 tends to 0 x k tends to x a that is what is called analysis the limiting value of x k is called analysis. Therefore, we have now found conditions under which this Christman like scheme will converge the condition for Christmas Christman like scheme to converge is simply that is simply that the spectral radius of i minus t must be less than or equal to 1. So, that gives you a design criteria and I am going to um, uh, spend a couple of minutes on that now go back one can do a lot of simple experiments you can fix a particular method for h you can pick a particular method for w you can multiply this you can get a t and then you can do an eigen analysis for i minus t and recover and see when if I. So, you can keep h fixed you can change w or you can keep w fixed change h 
for which combination of h and w one gets a matrix i minus t such that its spectral radius is less than less than less than 0. If you can strike a combination you got you, you, you got you got the gold. So, that is the basic idea that is the design question. Mm. So, here we are not interested in talking about how to design we are in please interested in guidelines to the design. So, i minus t the row the, 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 the spectral radius being less than 1 provides the broad guidelines to the design of h and w. So, when when this term goes to 0 again go, come back again this term goes to 0 17 reduces to 18 17 reduces to 18 and um, so x the, the, the analysis minus uh, so what is that x a minus x b x b is the prior x a is the analysis. So, you can think of x a minus x b is called the analysis increment the analysis increment is simply calculated by w t inverse z minus eta naught you know what eta naught is and how do you solve this in order to be able to do this you do not have to compute the inverse of t. So, if you want to compute t inverse z minus eta naught you simply need to do the following solve the equation t y is equal to z minus eta naught then y will be equal to t inverse z minus eta naught. I would uh, why am I mentioning this I want to tell you a couple of things now your interest is not in trying to compute t inverse you can do this by computing t inverse and multiplying, but I do not want t inverse I only want t inverse times z minus z naught. So, what is the best way to compute t inverse z naught please do not indulge in inverting the matrix t because it will take long time you simply write the linear equation t y is equal to z minus eta naught solve it y is indeed equal to t inverse z minus z minus eta naught. So, you 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 solve the system you get so you you got this 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 is what we call as y. So, x a is equal to x b plus w y. So, I have now given you a pathway to compute the analysis starting from the background and an increment y the y depends on solving the equation in 19. So, that is the pathway to proving convergence and this is very educative because it tells the role of w it tells the role of h It also indirectly provides conditions on not on h alone w alone, but the product h w that creates t that creates t. So, what was thought to be a good heuristical method can be put in a in a firm mathematical background once we do the convergence analysis. So, with this convergence analysis we have equation 20 equation 20 is the essence of the schemes that were used in 1950s and 60s. So, what is the basic scheme you give me an x b background on the grid based on the observation you compute w you compute uh, I am I'm, I'm sorry based on the grid um, um, and, and, and a rating scheme create a matrix w you create an interpolation matrix h you solve for y from 19 x a the the initial initial condition mosaic that I am going to have to use to generate the model forward in time is x a it is simply the sum of x b plus w y x b plus w y. So, that is a very nice and important uh, 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 methodology that was used and very successfully 50s and 60s using these schemes they repeated this experiment every day to be able to create an analysis every day to be able to run the model forward in time and and they were very successful in the in the early computer age with respect to creating good forecasts. Now, I am going to uh, leave you with a couple of very good problems these are very important problems. So, I am going to spend a couple of minutes on this um, generate generate a 10 by 10 unit gr two dimensional grid with th 100 points locate randomly 40 observations and um, the if I have 10 grid points there are only 9 times 9 grid boxes. So, what is the grid box let us let us come in here. So, there are 3 grid points here there are 3 grid points here there are 2 times 2 4 grid boxes. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 
there are 9 grid points, there are 4 grid boxes, your observations are going to go within the grid boxes. So, you are going to have to distribute 40 observations in 81 grid boxes, generate x b which is r 100, I would like to be able to ask you to generate the background mean is 90, w i is, is, is a noise, you, you th this must be normal this is this is normal 0. Uh, so, z v i is normally distributed 0 mean and sigma square b as a variance. I am going to ask you to pick sigma b square to be phi that the that is the variance. So, you generate the noise add to 90 you get you, you generate 100 random vectors you, you have uh, 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 the background information. Then compute h which is the 40 by 100 matrix using the bilinear interpolation that we developed in module 3.6, module 3.6. So, that is that so we have we have we have we have the back. So, here we have generated the background, here we generate h. Now, I am going to generate observations, observations are generated by this equation again, this is again normal. Observational covariance is different from the background covariance. So, I have all the components now I have h, I have x b, I have z. You now need to compute the weight matrix using the Kressman method, using Barnes method. There are two methods for doing this. Implement the successive iter iteration described above and iterate until convergence. So, it is a very beautiful scheme. If you can do this on a computer, then you can say you thoroughly understand some of the classical methods. These methods are still could be used they are very powerful they are very meaningful and uh, uh, these are heuristically developed, but, but it is for the power it is for the simplicity it is for the elegance I believe these kinds of exercises uh, should be done by anybody who is involved interested in trying to learn the tools and techniques for data simulation. Uh, again the uh, part 2 is I would like you to continue I would like you to be able to compute the matrix um, T which is equal to H times W using the H and W that we picked in problem the previous problem compute the eigenvalues of T compute the spectral radius of A is equal to I minus T and check whether the spectral radius is less than or equal to 1 if it is 1 you are done if it is not the scheme still makes sense, but it may not converge. So, what is that I would like you to do now? vary the location and the number of observations. In each case compute T is equal to H of W and compute the spectral radius and find out for what kind of combinations the spectral radius of T is greater than 1 for what kind of combination the spectral radius is less than 1. I believe it is a very interesting uh, worthwhile research it one can even develop a master s thesis or perhaps part of a PhD thesis out of it. So, we only provided the general theory for convergence trying to utilize the general theory and, and transferring to the actual design questions of W and H I believe would be a worthwhile interesting research topic at the MS PhD at least part of the PhD it can be one full master's thesis project. This uh, in here uh, uh, this module follows chapter 19 in our book Lewis Lakshmi Rahan and Dahl with that we conclude our discussion of the classical methods for data simulation. Thank you.